Welcome back to Trending in Education. Dan Straffer, Melissa Griffith, and Mike Palmer along with you. And on today's episode, we're taking another look at data and perhaps some privacy when talking about brain-computer interface technology, some changes over the summer at Carnegie Mellon in using non-invasive forms. We'll talk about that and more learning implications. But first and foremost, always like to check in. Mike, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, I'm excited to talk about brains. Uh, you know I love brains. So we love brains. We love robots. Uh, we're probably not going to talk about robots, but we'll talk about brains, and we'll talk about uh, brain-computer interfaces, also known as BCI. So uh, for those of you uh, near a keyboard, you may want to go to Wikipedia, look up BCI. Uh, you know, we've done that already, so we have a slight edge on you. But, uh, but yeah, and it's always wonderful to have Melissa here uh, as someone who's expressed some uh, potential openness to uh, a, a brain computer interface of sorts. Uh, Brandon Jones, who used to be on the show, uh, had eagerly volunteered uh, for Elon Musk's venture Neuralink. He wanted to be the first guy to get the Neuralink hookup yeah, patient zero. Yep. into his brain. The first one that gets it really wins <laughs> <laughs> or loses. Or do they? <laughs> yes. So, uh, so it should be an interesting, uh, interesting conversation. Uh, welcome to the show, Melissa. Thank you. Uh, I'm so glad to be here, and I'm glad you guys uh, fung the topic that I may be like, oh, just kidding. I'm going to back off of this yes. one for a little bit, but yes. let, let's see how it goes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for those of you who didn't listen to the data privacy show, Melissa does like uh, having the ability to use Google and Apple and the different things that uh, take her data and then make her life better. Uh, seem to be very open to it. Mike and I maybe a little further back than that, but now talking about BCI here and to define it, uh, not from Wikipedia, but uh, it's a computer-based system that acquires brain signals, analyzes them, and translates them into commands that are relayed to an output device. So that's sort of the starting point here uh, for what these are. There's the positive, Mike. There's the learning aspects of it. There's the medicine, obviously. Uh, there's lots to talk about for uh, individuals with special needs and mm -hmm. translation of their thoughts. And then we do tend to also take a look at the nefarious side of maybe some surveillance. Can people track thoughts through cell phones and, and advertise specifically The Guardian with a recent article on that that I may reference a little bit. But overall thoughts, here from you on this technology, what you've seen in, in the articles you've read, and where you think this sort of technology will trend over the next six months, year, and, and out from there. Yeah, sure. Um, like for me, what I love about it is it's a great example of universal design for learning, which we've talked about before. So a lot of this technology is emerging, as you mentioned, Dan, for um, uh, quadriplegics, uh, people who are uh, unable to speak. Um, is where a lot of the research uh, began and um, it's continued to evolve. Like there's also a blend of the brain interaction and being able to uh, communicate through nonverbal uh, gestures. Uh, facial recognition is something uh, that we've talked about a lot, whether it relates to data privacy uh, on the one hand, but then also as it relates to um, picking up on um, people's emotional states and being able to uh, respond uh, and then training individuals to be able to communicate with um, computers and technology in ways that don't require um, a mouse click or a vocalization. Uh, it's inevitable that new modes of interacting, new interfaces are gonna emerge. And, um, uh, you know, I think like any new technology, there's going to be risk around. It reminds me when we're talking about uh, data privacy, um, there probably will need to be ways in which this is regulated. Um, but as we mentioned, like frequently the regulations can't anticipate the misuse. So like the, the regulation is going to follow on the heels of the early trials and the early applications. I will say just to conclude, and I love to hear uh, my colleagues takes on these things. Um, you know, we did talk about uh, Elon Musk in the early days of trending in education, uh, the, this empty seat over here, uh, which you guys can't see, uh, is, uh, was originally called the Elon, Elon Musk seat. He's got four companies, Tesla, electric cars, uh, the boring companies, Hyperloops, uh, I know these, uh, Neuralink, which is the, the BCI one, and then SpaceX, which is space travel. Um, I think out of all of these, the one that I am most intrigued by is Neuralink. So like, I do think 
part of why we're talking about this and why we talked about neuroscience on the show a lot is that it's a place where science fact is becoming very similar to science fiction and probably the most mind expanding way. Um, so I'm very hopeful about it. Um, but like any new technology and anything that could be invasive, uh, even though the, this research is saying you won't actually need to uh, enter the brain uh, physically to, to make some of these connections, uh, it does get scary. And, um, and we're also probably going to drop this in the Halloween season. So yes. it's scary, right, brains? So, uh, so yeah, so that was my opening salvo. Uh, I cede my time. <laughs> That is good to know, Melissa. Thoughts, overall thoughts on BCI and where I this am, could lead? I am not sure I can follow that, but like, follow me down my little rabbit hole because um, I've always said like the the difference between crazy and non-crazy is action, mm -hmm. right? Like I think a lot of people think things. Like I'm like, oh, Mike really sucks. I'm thinking about killing him right now, but I will never act upon it and i'm just kidding yeah this, this may be down the rabbit hole right, but follow right. me feel, through. feel free to bring these thoughts when you're not in the same <laughs> small room as me but yes 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 um but that is that is why this one makes me a little nervous so i am usually on the forefront of let's us use things for education let us lose, use things to like advanced learning I, there's so much applications for this um but there's so much so much applications to like misuse information like fleeting thoughts are right. a real thing and so to the extent that you can't control the entry point to like when people have access to my brain versus not to the extent that i can control that that really makes it nervous because i think a lot of things um i have a creative mind i, I go down some rabbit holes in my own head and you hear a lot of it you just heard a little bit of it two seconds ago <laughs> I don't think I should be judged on, on the crazy, I right. think, because, and, right. and that is my worry. Like, uh, where does this, we talked a little bit about security last, last week. Where does this application go? If I'm super frustrated with somebody and I have a, I have a bad thought, am I now going to be arrested for that bad thought? Like, mm -hmm. like where, is the, where is the drawback of that? Mm -hmm. So that is my only worry about this. That being said, I am always worried about things I don't know a lot about. And so... I, I think like everything else, I am interested. I can see the benefits mm -hmm. and I'm open to see where it goes. But I do think this is, this is a, this is a slippery slope. I, I would say the movie Minority Report, which I don't know if everybody's seen. Oh, it's a Tom totally. Cruise. That's what, what, the way you were describing that now uh, is what came to mind, Mike, with the science fact versus mm -hmm. science fiction idea. Yep. We are inching closer, maybe not to precogs and, and predicting the future, but who knows, but more to, hearing those thoughts that are better left unsaid, potentially, right? Mm -hmm. This is a potential outcome of this sort of technology, especially as it expands beyond, Mike, I guess what we can call wearables, non-invasive helmets or, yes. or things that you opt into wearing comparatively right. to technology that is just constantly out, right? That is right. in the world via cell phones. The Guardian article to, to touch on that point was very much about, you know, you're walking down a street, you see a coat, uh, you think, oh, I should buy that because it's raining, but you don't buy it. And then you're on the subway, you're scrolling through your social feed and there's that coat right. in, in your feed. It's a possibility. Do you, again, this is the, the good versus the bad. It seems the medicine side of this is huge. It could be life altering for so many people, mm -hmm. but in the wrong hands could become a really, really invasive and uh, tough thing to actually peel back once it happens. Right. How do you, how do you weigh those two things? Or is this see it first and then react like we've talked about Congress doing with the regulations. Right. Um, I don't know. Like, I, I think it's a place where narrative is really interesting and, uh, and how it's framed is really important. So like for me, the framing around uh, folks who are not fully functional, getting access to pretty close to full functionality is, is kind of an awesome aspect of this technology and it's easy to lose sight of. And mm -hmm. that's really why, this technology has emerged. Um, interestingly, it's, it's also existed in other formats. Um, the Diving Bell and the Butterfly is a really amazing uh, read. If you did want to read a book from, uh, from several years back, it's about um, a stroke victim who lost all movement aside from the ability to blink his eyes. And he was able to communicate just by blinking the number of letters, you know, A would be one blink, Z would be 26 links, uh, blinks. 
he was able to communicate to his assistant this wonderful uh, novel or sort of narrative um, without being able to speak. And that part is the thing that's really activating my imagination in an interesting way is like, how much do we take for granted aspects of, uh, you know, our, our humanity when we think about what it means to be human and then when new technology opens up access for folks who didn't have those mechanisms before, uh, we should just pause and celebrate that and before we get into the, the more natural paranoia of what are the other applications of this technology. So like just the fact that scientists and engineers at Carnegie Mellon and like they're one of many research institutions that are doing this have figured out a way for, it's not invasive too, like they're not actually getting into your brain. It's like by virtue of putting uh, electrodes and an apparatus on your head, you can make simple commands just by thinking. Um, that is something to just pause and reflect on, understanding that it came out of a genuine need. Right. And then the fact that we as a culture will now have this capability, um, it is, awe-inspiring and and then you can get paranoid about it but like but i think it's important to pause for that moment because just think of the, the lives that are being impacted by technology like this and then also um when we have an opportunity to think about use cases that might be transformational mm -hmm. they don't all have to be you know black mirror screenplays like they can also be you know and and sure, they will be driven by commercial concerns. I understand your your point there, which to me gets back to the same point around an opt out, like, which is why facial recognition in public spaces is a technology that is related and very concerning. Where like when individuals don't understand they're being surveilled, that's where I think you do cross a line. Um, but uh, but anyway, that was just sort of my initial like. We only have about a half hour show, but I wanted to take. A little bit of time to say thank you science well thank you carnegie mellon and uh you know this technology will continue to emerge it's up to us to think about the ethical implications okay. and the way it can be managed but um but it's pretty awe-inspiring uh to think these breakthroughs are just starting and and there's going to be additional funding to build on these successes um I think this conversation will get increasingly relevant, increasingly relevant to learning and uh, education. But, um, but yeah, that was my initial thought. So no, so I'll add to that. So plus one to everything you said, like I, um, I fundamentally believe you're right. And like my stance on technology is always progress is good. Mm -hmm. Moving forward is good. And so this, this gives a chance to so many people and so many lives to change their lives. Like you wanna, you wanna allow it. The, the challenge I think that we're going to have here, and I'm going to bring back to a lot of the conversation too we were having last week. The challenge you're going to have here is like, if this is in the hands of Carnegie Mellon or, or Duke or, or like colleges or like or John, the, Hops, the, John Hopkins. The, the Sorbonne right? or uh, Tadai University in, in uh, Japan. You yeah. know, I'm trying to be global. Yeah. and uh, Be global. Yeah. If, 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 if it's in the hands of people who are like moving it forward and are doing good things with it, right? But very rarely do we hit upon a technology where good pays, mm -hmm. right? And if good pays, then we get into the whole healthcare issue, which we can talk about later. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think we should advance it. I absolutely think we should advance it. My worry is that this like technology like this, because Facebook also uh, like is exploring this technology, mm -hmm. I believe with Carnegie Mellon mm -hmm. as well, right? Yeah. And, and so the challenge then becomes when you commercialize it, you're gonna go, you're gonna break bad pretty quickly on something yeah. like this. And so, yeah, I don't have a problem. Like if you heard me say it last week and I'd be a hypocrite if I, I changed it. If, I will weigh every choice that is given to me, right? So if Google makes my life easier, yep. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be willing. So if I did think about that jacket and I really wanted that jacket and I want to act on it really quickly, mm -hmm. Google has made my life easy if it's at my house by the time I get home. Right. Happy. Right. I am worried about just the ramification of this is the last foray into my privacy that yes. you're going to go into. And that's, that will always be my worry. But yep. like, let the technology be used for good and the future fear that I'm 
facing is that it's a future fair. If it gets into the wrong hands, we're going to have to regulate it and we're going to have to shut it down. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think I'm, I'm close to where you're at on this. I think for me, it does just as the, as we think about skills development and the future of work, it does speak to the need for new skills around uh, ethics mm -hmm. and um, you know, uh, establishing a more thoughtful approach to um, communications and brand management as individuals become more concerned about these sort of, you know, even though it's not physically invasive, it's still a very invasive technology, just like face, facial recognition is, is really invasive, you know, so in, in its own way. So like, I think brands will need to achieve a new level of sophistication to effectively commercialize this. And also I think unlike um, SpaceX, you know, if you think about space exploration, it's gonna take a long time for that to become uh, a commercial endeavor that will bear fruit. Uh, I think it's something that folks are very interested in. You could probably charge people a premium to go to outer space, but I think this technology I would expect to accelerate in its commercial uses much faster. Uh, right. We even saw, I think it was the Emotix, Dan, we were looking at, like there's an $800 uh, like hat you can wear that you can read your, EG, your electroencephalogram with. And uh, that's already a commercial, like that's a consumer product that's already out there. You can't really do anything with it, right. but like, but it's out there and like those costs are going to come down. The functionality is going to go up. And uh, I think the, the commercial opportunity is going to grow in this space. But the, I think the go to market is going to have to become equally sophisticated because I actually think there are natural checks and balances around privacy that um, in some ways the first wave of social media got a free pass on just because uh, it, it emerged and now we're trying to play catch up. I'm curious how things proceed in the next, say, five to 10 years, where how can uh, the marketplace be informed? It's the same thing we were talking about on the data science side. Um, and how can brands navigate the complexity around data privacy as the, um, these emerging technologies uh, enter the marketplace? Um, I think that'll be next level skills, like the, to be able to market something as uh, making your life better, but also being safe. And also like, it's kind of the way Apple has attacked the, the, the data privacy problem has generally been a little bit better than some other brands. Like they've actually had design intent to encrypt, even if it means at the cost of their sort of commercial opportunities. And I feel like as these types of technologies emerge, I think smart brands are gonna get sophisticated around the ethics of it, around mm -hmm. the, the, the value prop and around sort of who they are as a brand. And that's why, like, I do think Facebook's in trouble. Like, I, I, I think there's, there's a population out there who probably have a positive take on Facebook who would allow for this level mm -hmm. of invasiveness from that brand. But I think that that population is getting smaller. And, um, I do still believe, you know, the the arc of history bends towards progress. Like I, I think it's it's all of it's all of our jobs to make sure we're informed and we're spreading the word. Uh, but I think smart brands hopefully will get out ahead of this. Um, I just think just building on what we talked about on the data uh, data privacy show. I don't know if the regulatory environment's really the right yeah. place to look for an answer. Yeah, I don't. I don't think the. I I almost never ear to the side of the government that's going to solve this problem for us. I think private companies are going to have to solve it. And companies that do understand that the companies that will survive are the companies who get it ethically right mm -hmm. uh, on this factor. And yes, for sure, uh, it's a no brainer. I do not think Facebook survives mm -hmm. uh, in, in this world. TBD, whether Google does or, right. or whether Apple does or anyone, like thus far, they have been proven to be at least ahead of it, not always ethically um, the best, but ahead of it. For me, I will say this, I am, I'm 100% in agreement that the, the benefits of this technology are probably going to outweigh the risks. Mm -hmm. yep. And it's because it's early on, I'm still thinking the risks are pretty strong uh, on this one in particular, because I do, it's even like, I've always had this thought process around when you hear me err on the side of, ah, let's, let's just see how it goes, like to implant 
uh, I'm planted in my brain. I'm always, I am always interested in the fact, right? Like, can I learn? How much quicker can I learn? Like right now, mm -hmm. like we always joke about this, like, oh, we can, like, there's no argument that um, goes on for too long in my house because I'm like, I pick up my phone. I'm like, let me Google that for you. Right. Um, and we'll solve that argument. Can you imagine a world where you just think it and, and it's there? Sure. And well, it's, I mean, yeah, go ahead. I, it's just uh, growing up, it was always fun facts to know and tell. If someone knew something, they would be able to share. My brother was sort of a, a fountain of information, but now Google's at our hands and my mm -hmm. kids will flat out say, hey, dad, can you look this up when they get frustrated with something? And I'll look it up on my phone. But I think you made a point there, Melissa, that I wanted to go further on of right now, the opt-in is the physical you know, chip in brain or contraption on your head, right? So you see the opt-in of, uh, they are saying now with a small chip in the brain, they can control or, or plant uh, neural firings with the cell phone, right? That was an article on Science Daily back mm -hmm. in August. So that is happening, but it's an opt-in, right? Is that enough for you, Melissa, at present that the physical opt-in needs to either be something on your head tracking firing or actually having something inserted in your brain to be a part of this research and, and development. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and TBD, whether I opt in or not right. on, on this particular juncture. I, I like to believe like I'm a fast, um, a fast follower on things like this. Like usually I want to be at the the tip of it. Like I want to be the, one of the first movers, but on this one, I will definitely <laughs> yeah. fast follower. Right. Uh, brain, when, my brain is my brain. When you're cliff diving, <laughs> yeah. you want to make sure the, the, fir the, the water is deep enough. Right. Let yeah. somebody else go first. And if they seem happy, sure. Right. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Like enough people land and tell me it's okay. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to be there with you. So yeah. yes, for me, it is. Uh, for me, it's also though critically important that like we educate the people totally. who are going to opt in and are going to be the ones opt in. Cause this one's, this one's, this one's dangerous. You're like, like uh, a chip in my brain can lead to a lot of other things besides you just feed me adver uh, advertisements. It could lead to you being able to control my every movement. And, right. and that's, and that is my worry, right? You're, right. you're taking away choice. You're becoming, yep godlike uh for lack of a better word right i got a i got a next angle okay so we 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 had a awe we said awe that that's amazing we were able to do this now we're ready i can break a little more paranoid right yes yeah so, sure uh because maybe there's some some truth to this when you think about cybersecurity, which came up previously mm -hmm. um and you think like one of the major components of uh cyber threats these days are states uh you know cyber cyber espionage um from like china russia these are concerns that we have once these interfaces open up mm -hmm. like one of the concepts we're going to do a deeper dive on cybersecurity in the in the coming months that'll be fun but um basically this this idea of attack surfaces and anytime you open up a new front you become vulnerable mm -hmm to attack and this is extremely concerning at a time when we certainly have we i'm not convinced we're, we're able to put the genie back in the bottle just around social media when it required a user with either a phone or the internet to kind of open themselves up to those attack surfaces if now i opt in and i'm available for uh, thought insertions. The crazy thing is, just to close out on the paranoid thing, these are exactly the types of paranoid delusions that people who are in mental institutions have. Yes. And now this technology is real. Yes. So like, talk about that. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, could, I could see your parano and paranoia and raise you on. Yes, I'm not, I'm, no, I'm not going to do it. Oh, I, I'm you're, not just gonna do it. it. you're just calling I'm, it. I'm just going to call it that. There is so many places that my brain can go on where this is going to go bad for us. Yeah. The thing I will say is like, this is where I do think like some, at the start, some blanket regulations are, are, are clear that we need. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I don't think you should be allowed to insert a chip in your brain without some sort of like mental psych evaluation check right. on on how you will deal with it. Uh, I think there may you may need to have an age limit, like like just like license. You can't have a license until yeah. you're 18. Right. You may want to have some sort of like just it's arbitrary, but just put an arbitrary rule in place because you what you want to be able to know is that any human that has it 
can handle it because I can I can break real bad and go right. like once you put these things in like it's the the fact that when ca cars became computerized all of a sudden you can control cars right. like you can definitely see a world where like um, somebody who doesn't know better thinks, oh, I can get smarter, easy way out, right. takes these ships, and all of a sudden there's an army at someone else's control because right. if you build it, you can hack it, right. and, and someone's hacking it. Right, right. So, I, I, li I like where you're going there because it's almost like, and yeah, I want to get you in on this too, but like uh, you're saying like install like a breathalyzer at the, the chip shop, and uh, it reminds, it made me think immediately about getting tattoos where like, people typically are a little messed up when they get their first tattoo. And I do wonder if they'll be like fly by night, get your Neuralinks here. And they're, they're right, you know, down on Bourbon street or down in like near, near where, where young folks. Atlantic are. city. Yeah. Get a, little yeah. Wack, get a little wacky. Hey, I got, I got ideas. And then also is the technology of a tattoo parlor. I totally will see it after this Dan, Cause I need to get out of the way, but like, could you trans like us the other problem around like electric cars is like how do you how do you actually scale how this is uh entering the marketplace is it like do, do you go to the tattoo parlor and with your uh christopher walk-in tattoo you also get a Neuralink? right i don't know i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna, I'm gonna cede my time to you dan please yeah. continue on the electric car front it, it was interesting at our local supermarket they now have four spots in the front of the parking lot that are electric car spots so you can plug yeah. in so you are seeing that scaling happening so maybe it is uh a tattoo shop or a barber shop maybe you get a two for one yeah a sh a, or three for one shave a haircut and you get a, a chip installed uh, while you're there i do want to go back to a slight positive here and, and follow me on this analogy if you will we've been talking about the read aspect of this right reading our brain waves reading what about the write aspect, right? So talking about a hard drive, read and write, you're writing data on it. Melissa, you touched on a little bit about Google, right? Can Google get right in my brain and have that answer for me right away? That would seem to be a, a large implication here to Neuralink. Think of the Matrix, which are apparently making a new Matrix movie, uh, just downloading information uh, to your brain, making the easy way out. Is that science fiction enough for you, Mike, where that's far enough down the road? Or do you think this sort of research is going to lead or is at least thinking about leading to similar downloadable content straight into that chip that's inside the brain? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's really interesting questions. And to me, this speaks to uh, something that came up uh, on when we were at Sound Education is like, to me, it speaks to the, the value of folks who are exploring these ideas, whether it's mind-body problems, like uh, the ethics of new technologies, like things that traditionally have been the realm of philosophers, ethicists, social scientists, I think are becoming increasingly relevant to the conversation about technology. And um, this is a reminder of that. So like, what's interesting about what you're talking about is when there is a you who is bringing those thoughts in, and then the way you receive those thoughts are as though they aren't your own. Um, I think that becomes dangerous. Um, I am listening to uh, Michael Pollan's book, uh, How to Change Your Mind about psychedelics. And it's a similar concept where like, you understand more what, uh, what traditional consciousness is by breaking it, it with these, these sort of interventions. But at least that book's talking much more about the importance of a controlled environment and a trusted guide. So um, hats off, uh, maybe tinfoil hats off to the, uh, the folks who are going to opt into these clinical trials. Uh, and realistically, a lot of them, I think, yeah. are going to be folks who, who need this to be fully able. Um, so that's why, like, as much as I think we have appropriate cautionary notes, I think there's there is a lot of hope to be realized here, just like anything, it's got two sides. But, um, but yeah, it's interesting stuff, you know, and I think the Terminator is also coming out. So it's totally it zeitgeisty. Yeah. This is all zeitgeisty. Skynet, Skynet probably did this at some point before they rolled out uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, they had to, for cyborgs to happen, you gotta, you gotta solve this problem. Yeah. So, I mean, we are definitely doing the Halloween episode. I think we are, are sufficiently paranoid here. Good job by us. Uh, good job by us. Uh, I, so here, here's my, here's my final view. I definitely think, um, I definitely think there's tremendous value in it. I will even say during the whole course of this conversation, I've been like, 
I'm so curious how it feels mm -hmm. to just have information at your fingertips. Because one of the things I've been like, uh, I've been musing about in, in my head, which you would know if yeah. like you had access to it by right. these brainwaves, um, is like, will I learn from it? Like, and, and does it even matter? So if I could think it and I know, sure. right? Like, does it matter if I actually retain that information or now do I always know it? And then at uh, uh, the meta level, am I now, do I cease to exist in consciousness because mm -hmm. everything is just a computer telling me what I'm doing? Right. Like, and so it's a, it's, but I'm curious of how that feels. Yes. Right. So I guess my, my final thought is, yeah, I'm interested. Yeah. I, I take, I take it. I, I need to be able to be assured that once I take the implant, I can take it out if I, I need be. Yeah. Reversibility is huge. Yeah. I will say, uh, Mike, you may mention of the Terminator, for any NBA fans out there, NBA just getting started, there's a great uh, commercial of sorts for Terminator with Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Linda, Linda Hamilton that mm. Paul George posted to his Instagram. It's on Twitter as well. It's pretty funny. Mm. Uh, not surprisingly, makes Kawhi Leonard look like a Terminator himself mm. because he has been robotic many times over in his interviews. But a uh, conversation we'll come back to, and obviously one that's going to continue to develop as the science develops and as people look at this from a learning perspective management growth potential uh, over the next six months year and on from there as always trending in education is available across multiple podcast apps you can go to stitcher you can go to tune in you can go to overcast of course itunes as well trending education.com linkedin.com slash trending in education available on twitter and facebook at trending in ed as always thanks so much for listening to trending in education